Well, this time children in preschool through kindergarten are dismissed for children's church. And as they're going, I invite you to turn with me once again to the passage which David read for us from the book of Hebrews chapter 13. Thank you so much for, there we are. Thank you so much for uh, just uh, kind words, David. And uh, what a joy it is uh, to look back and to reflect upon 31 years of ministry and, and uh, uh, I just uh, so much appreciate uh, the love that you've given my family throughout the years. And even in these present days, what a joy that is and what an encouragement that is to us. Well, as we come to the word this morning, let us... Uh, be in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the, the word that we have before us to stay. Father, we thank you that all scripture is useful, profitable, as the apostle writes. And Father, we would ask that you would use it to our profit, our benefit, to our blessing this day. Father, we ask that you would help us to see the truths of your word, not simply that we might gain information, but Father, that you might lead us by your spirit to application. And so Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes that we might see wonderful things in your word. And as you reveal them to us, Father, may they not fall upon deaf ears, but Father, may they find expression as we go out from this place this day. Father, speak to us. Father, we ask that you would cause your presence to be known in these moments. And as you do that, we will give you the praise and we will give you the glory because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, believe it or not, with all the announcements I gave this morning, there was one that I forgot. This evening at 7 o'clock, the community Thanksgiving service will be held. Uh, all the churches come together for a time of, of, of worship and of praise and reflecting upon God's goodness to us. And that will be held at the Fisher Community Center. Uh, and so we would just invite you to come and be a part of that and encourage you to uh, join with the body of Christ, the broader body of Christ within the Fisher area for that service uh, this evening. Well, we, we sing those words. We are so blessed by the gifts from your hand. I just can't understand why you loved us so much. Isn't that true? <laughs> why would God love us so much? What is man that you're mindful of us, the son of man that you care for us, right? The psalmist says, why you would love us so much. We, we are so blessed, we just can't find a way or the words that can say, thank you, Lord, for your touch. These words reminded me of Jesus' words, or the words of Jesus' brother, James, as recorded in James chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. There he writes, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. You know, that, that first sentence struck differently this past week. Don't be deceived. If there's anything good in your life, if there is any blessing that you think, I am grateful for that, understand where it comes from. Satan offers you no good thing. Understand that? So often we think that, uh, well, Adam and Eve, didn't they think that? That Satan had something good to offer them. That sin was the path to blessing. That disobedience, that rebellion against God was the place and the path of good. <laughs> Satan would have us believe that, right? Don't be deceived. Satan offers you nothing of value. Do not be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Every material blessing that we enjoy, 
every relationship which breathes life into our lives. Every spiritual blessing of salvation and the promise of eternal life does not come to us through Satan, but through God in Christ. Never be deceived about that. Satan never gives good gifts. God always does. So this being the case, can we find a way? Can we find words to say, thank you, Lord, for your touch? for your blessing upon our lives. Well, I, I hope that we can, and I trust that we want to, and that we, especially during this season, will be intentional about finding ways to say, thank you, Lord, for the touch of your hand upon my life and upon the lives of those that I love and care for. This is, or should be, the impulse of the Christian. This is made plain in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. There the writer says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we are receiving blessings that cannot be removed from us. Let us be thankful. And so worship God and accept, acceptably with reverence and awe. We are receiving the blessings of the kingdom of God. We are receiving the benefits of being a part of God's kingdom, uh, citizens of his kingdom. And, and of this kingdom, the apostle Peter says that those who are in Christ will receive, and again, this struck differently this past week, we will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A rich welcome. Some of you will be going home for the holidays. And some of you will be welcoming family into your home over the holidays. When someone from the family comes. Yeah, good to see you. No. A rich welcome. Welcome home. It is so good to have you here. To be home together. And that's what Peter says. We will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And which leads us here. The Heavenly Father meets every one of his children at the door of his kingdom. And he says, welcome home. This is the place you belong. I've been waiting for you, and we will abide together forever. Wow. That's something to be grateful for, isn't it? To be thankful for. How, how then do we, as followers of Christ, adequately say thank you to the Lord for those blessings? Well, there's multiple ways laid out in Scripture, but there are two ways laid out in the passage which David read for us earlier in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 11 through 16. And I want to take a look at those this morning. And I want us to understand there are some ways, some tangible ways, some real ways that we can say, thank you, Lord, for your touch on my life. And let's take a look at those this morning. The first one is this. We can say thanks to God by taking our stand with Christ. By identifying publicly with our Savior Jesus. Throughout the book of Hebrews, the, the writer has drawn parallels between the Jewish sacrificial system and its fulfillment in Christ. All the sacrifices, the entire sacrificial system as laid out by Moses, are only really pointing to one thing. The true and ultimate sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. The sacrificial system required a high priest who could enter into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, and who would offer a sacrifice to God in payment for mankind's sin. 
Well, well, Jesus is the fulfillment of that reality as he is the great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, having made atonement for sin in the offering of a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. So Jesus is the great high priest to which the sacrificial system pointed. He is the ultimate fulfillment of that. And the sacrificial system required that a sacrifice... An offering, one without stain or blemish, a perfect sacrifice, would be offered in substitution for man's sin. And Jesus is the one without stain or blemish. He offered his own perfect, sinless life as the perfect sacrifice for sin. Do you understand that? He is the high priest who offers the acceptable sacrifice to God, and the sacrifice that he offers to God is himself. He is high priest, and he is sacrifice, all in one. The writer continues to draw similar parallels in our present text, where we read, The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. But the bodies, the carcasses of the sacrificial animals, of the lamb. Are burned outside the camp. The writer alludes to the Jewish Day of Atonement. When sacrifice was made for the nation's sin. The blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. And the carcass of the sacrifice was taken outside of the city, outside of Jerusalem, to be burnt. And so this parallel to Jesus' ministry. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make people holy through his blood. Though, though the parallel is inexact, the picture is clear. Jesus was crucified outside the city of Jerusalem. His carcass was sacrificed. Not in Jerusalem, but outside the city. And to the Romans, crucifixions were disgusting. They were the worst form of punishment they knew how to exact on anybody. Because it was a slow and painful, bloody process of dying. The Romans were disgusted by it. And the Jews, they likewise were appalled by it. To the Jews, those crucified were thought to be under the curse of God. And when Jesus hung on the cross, outside of the city, it was the Jews who said, this is no Messiah. Because obviously, he is under the curse of God. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So the scriptures say. Jesus could not be a Messiah or Savior. Just look at how he died. He was clear, crucified, clearly under the curse of God. But what, what the Romans nor the Jews understood, but which has been made clear to us this side of the cross, is that Jesus was not accursed by God. He bore our curse. For us. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace with God was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And notice this. It is not the example of Jesus which makes us holy in God's sight. It is his blood, his sacrifice, his death that saves us. There are so many people in this world today, well, just act like Jesus, follow his example. The problem is, we can't. We can't. He was perfect. We are not like that. We cannot save ourselves simply by acting like Jesus. We need his blood shed on our behalf to wipe away our sin. That we can stand 
in God's presence. Holy and blameless in his sight. And since the readers knew and understood this, there was a choice that was laid before them. To either identify themselves with Jesus, and in so doing make them outlaws of the Roman Empire and cast off from Jewish society, would they take their stand with Jesus or would they stand apart from him? Would the Jews, would the people, Jew or Gentile alike, Stand with Jesus. We go on and we read this. Let us then, because of what Christ has done for us, let us go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. See, Jesus stood outside the mainstream of the Roman and Jewish cultures of that day, and he beckoned his readers, take up your own cross and follow me. Take your stand with me, not in the city where everybody loves you, but outside the city where the accursed, or those sought accursed, go. The point is clear. that The readers are challenged to put it all on the line for Jesus. No more trying to live in two worlds, desiring the praise of God and the praise of men. To stand by Jesus' side outside the city gates and be thought of accursed right along with Jesus is the call that the writer of Hebrews makes. Let us go to him. Let us take our stand publicly with Jesus at the cross. And for the Christians of that day, there was only one compelling reason to reject the culture and to embrace Christ. They could and they would only embrace Christ if they had an eternal rather than a temporal perspective. As the writer says, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. If this world and its pleasures are all there is, then standing with Christ is foolishness, right? If this world is all there is, there is no reason to go to Christ outside the city and bear his shame and to stand with him and to acknowledge him. If this world is all there is, we can leave Jesus behind. But if this world and what it has to offer is but a foretaste of greater things to come for those who belong to Jesus, then rejecting Christ, no matter what the cost, is the height of foolishness. Every year in November, and sadly I realized it had passed us by, but every year there is a Sunday set aside for a day of prayer for the persecuted church around the world. International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. And it is a reminder as we participate in that, that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who at great cost to themselves go outside the city and stand at the foot of the cross and say, I'm with Jesus. People give their lives to take that stand. People lose their homes to take that stand. People lose their families to take that stand. This day, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, is a reminder of the high cost many are willing to pay to go stand with Jesus outside of the camp, outside of the city. Today, we live in a culture in which it grows more and more uncomfortable to take that stand with Jesus, right? Do you ever feel that? The temptation is greater and greater to hide our lights under a bushel. It grows ever more challenging to live in a society where the claims of Christ to be the Son of God, the Savior of man, are rejected. The, the old rugged cross stood outside the city, 
outside the camp. And so it does to this day. But many take their stand with Christ, and without embarrassment or fear, they proclaim, to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Are you there? Are you willing to take your stand publicly for Jesus? Will you stand with Christ in the expression of your trust in him, your love for him, and your gratitude to him? Oh, may we willingly bear any reproach, any stigma, any discomfort associated with going to Jesus outside the camp of our culture, that we may follow him and in so doing, standing shoulder to shoulder with Jesus as an expression of our gratitude for the great things he has done for us. How do we say thanks? Is there any way? Yeah, we take our stand with Jesus. Not ashamed to be identified with him. But secondly, we can say thanks to God by offering our sacrifices through Christ. It's interesting, the, the early Christians were often accused of being irreligious people. In fact, of being atheists. They, they were accused of having no religion at all. After all, these Christians, these followers of Jesus, they never offered any animal sacrifices. Think about that. Every religion in the world, in those days, to be a religious person, you offered some type of sacrifice to your God, right? No, no matter if it was Judaism, the pagan religions, there was sacrifice offered to, in most cases, appease the gods. But Christians never did offer animal sacrifices. And so they were accused of having no religion. And, and even if the Christian wanted to offer a sacrifice, they, they had no place of doing it. They had no way of doing it. And that neglect was tantamount in the eyes of non-believers to having no religion. And perhaps these accusations were taking a toll on these Christians who had most likely come out of Judaism and were used to offering sacrifices but had left behind animal sacrifices, and they were hearing it from their kinfolk and from Gentiles alike. So the writer goes to some length to remind his readers that even though we have no altar, and we offer no sacrifices of animals for the payment of our sins, he reminds them we do have a great high priest through whom we do offer thank offerings to God in response to the blessings that he gives us on our lives. These Christian sacrifices offered to God through Christ were of two varieties. They were not of animal variety, but they were sacrifices of heart and sacrifices of hand. The, the sacrifice from the heart. The writer says, through Jesus, through him, our great high priest, let us therefore continually, and that word continually means through all or in all circumstances at all times, there is never an opportunity and never a time when a sacrifice is not offered or not appropriate. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Of praise. The fruit of lips that confess his name. A sacrifice of praise. The, the language is taken from the Old Testament where we read of thank offerings. There are primarily two types of offerings that came out of the Mosaic Law. There, there were offerings that were meant to deal with sin. And there were thank offerings which were offered in gratitude to God for his blessings and goodness. 
the sin offerings, they were, they were mandatory. You had to do them if you wanted to be right with God. The thank offerings were always voluntary. And some have said that in God's eyes, it was the thank offerings that were more pleasing than the sin offerings. The, the sin offering was given in order to receive something from God, forgiveness, while the thank offering was given freely from a heart that was grateful to God and a heart that was responsive to him and to what he had done. While Old Testament thank offerings consisted of some material commodity which was given to God, thank offerings to God offered on this side of the cross by his people consists first and foremost of the fruit of lips that confess his name. Now it's easy to, to breeze by this, no, no big deal to confess his name, is it? But in that day, it was a big deal. To confess the name of Christ was to speak out loud what you believe to be true about Jesus. To speak out loud that he is the Son of God, that he is the God-appointed, God-anointed Savior of the world, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the Father. To say that he is Lord, to publicly identify with Jesus as God's Son in that manner was pleasing above all else to the Father even though it was dangerous for the speaker in some cases to do. And not everyone, understand, would do it. Not everyone would speak the name of Jesus and identify with him. Recall what Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If an abiding love for Jesus did not reside within someone, a confession of Jesus' name would never be spoken because it would just be too costly. But many did speak the name of Jesus. And they did so out of the overflow of their heart. They continually offered a sacrifice of praise in response to God's blessing upon them. Remember the old song, I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed his name to bear. We're told that one day every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You want to put a smile on your heavenly Father's face? Don't wait for that day. Do it this day and every day. Confess the name of Jesus. Speak the name of Jesus. And so there is that sacrifice of our heart, out of our heart, over the overflow of our heart, over that which is within us, in our heart, is to speak the name of Christ. But along with the sacrifice of the heart, the Christian can offer the sacrifice of our hands. Again, the writer says, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, doing good and sharing with others, with sacrifices like that, not with animal sacrifice, but with sacrifices of doing good and to sharing with others. With those sacrifices, that which a Christian can offer, God is pleased. Do good and share. The writer has in mind actions which are characterized by kindness and generosity towards others. In, in a similar vein, James writes that religion that, our God, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. God places a high premium on doing good to others, not as a means to salvation, but as a sincere and grateful response to salvation, which is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. We don't do good and we don't share so that we can earn God's favor. We do so because God has already favored us in Christ. And know this as well. Do not forget. Do not neglect. See, the, the writer understands that there is a tendency, especially in difficult times, even for the, the Christian to become inwardly focused and to think about one's own needs rather than the needs of others. 
It, it's easy to do that, isn't it? Number of, uh, probably within the last six weeks or so, Allison and I, I'm not sure why, if we'd gone to a basketball game and Rhonda wasn't with us or what, but we, we went uh, through the drive through at Jimmy John's in Rantoul. And so we wait, we place our order in the drive through and uh, we get up and uh, get my wallet out and, and uh, she had got her uh, turkey slim with cheese sandwich and I'd got my hunt club, uh, hunter's club, the roast beef. And uh, so I, I get my wallet out and I'm going to pay it and, and uh, the, the lady there says, it's taken care of. In that moment, I'm thinking, gee, am I supposed to pay this forward? <laughs> I look at the rear view mirror, and there is a Yukon or a Suburban behind me. Tinted windows. For all I knew, there was 15 people back there. <laughs> so, I went. <laughs> I didn't pay it forward. Now, maybe that's excusable. But what the writer of Hebrews is saying is there is no excuse after what God and Christ has done for you, to not pay it forward. To not share and do good with others. If you have the minutest understanding of what God has done for you, do not forget. Do not neglect to do good and to share with others. Because when we think of others, as we care for the needs of others, as we show concern for others with those sacrifices, your Heavenly Father is pleased. Now we have no animal sacrifices to offer. And praise God that there is no need to because Jesus Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice. But there are sacrifices of the heart. Words which identify us with Jesus and sacrifices of our hands which are, are willing, giving and willing service to others. And with those sacrifices, God is pleased. We are so blessed by the gifts of God's hands. We can. We do. Have a way in words with which we can say, thank you, Lord for your touch, for your blessings. We can say thanks for the things that God and Christ has done for us by taking our stand with Jesus, publicly acknowledging his name. And we can offer spiritual sacrifices of heart and hand through Christ. During this Thanksgiving season, in gratitude to God, May we not be ashamed to identify ourselves as a follower of Jesus Christ. May we freely confess his name and acknowledge our relationship with him. Proclaiming that he is our Savior and Lord. And may acts of kindness and generosity freely flow from ourselves to others. Just as God's own kindness and generosity has flown so freely to us. In Christ. Another songwriter has pointed us to the cross of Christ, where the magnitude of love, so amazing, so divine, cries out for a grateful and worshipful response. Love of this magnitude that comes to us through Christ dem demands even more than words and deeds. As the writer says, it demands my soul, my life, my all. When you survey the wondrous cross, what will your response be? Oh, may it be, as the writer says, my soul, my life, my all. That is how we say things. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunities you give us to say thanks. Father, we don't have to, to question. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to say, boy, I just wish there was a way that God would know how pleased, how, how his blessings have blessed me. Because you've laid it out. Father, we take our stand with Jesus. The Father is pleased. You are pleased. 
and we confess the name and praise the name of Jesus. You're pleased. And when we mirror your generosity and your kindness to us, you're pleased. Father, may those sacrifices, those expressions of gratitude, flow freely from our lives. Father, enable us by your Spirit. To that end, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. When we survey the wondrous cross, what happens? Do we say, eh? Or do we say, wow? And if we say, wow, then we respond with our soul, our life, our all in gratitude to him. Would you stand as we sing those words together? life, my soul, my all. And all God's people said, amen. Go in peace. God's blessing upon you.